it proves to them that I'm not scamming them, that in fact, that there's a community of crazy hardcore evangelists all around the world who are happy to send them 69 sats or 2000 sats, which is, you know, maybe a dollar or two. And sometimes they leave a message, which is kind of cool. And when people start to see that, they're like, oh my God, it's not just you random British dude who's quite keen on this Bitcoin thing. It's also this giant community of Bitcoin believers and evangelists out there who are actually really passionate about seeing this thing succeed because they're confident that if we do adopt a Bitcoin standard, we will have a more peaceful world, you know, a fairer world and a, a world in which your money isn't eroded over time by central banking and governments. Okay, everybody, thanks uh, for joining in. Welcome to a new uh, episode of Bitcoin Equities Talks. Today, uh, I have with me the famous Joe Nakamoto, who's a Bitcoin journalist, advocate, maximalist, uh, all in on Bitcoin, I would say, and uh, one of the uh, most known voices uh, around uh, Bitcoin in the media space. So can you compliment my presentation, Joe, and uh, tell us a little <laughs> bit more about yourself? Yeah, that was a fantastic intro. Wow. How do I live up to that and present this famous Bitcoin advocate to your, to your listeners and viewers? Uh, thank you so much for having me on, Jad. It's a pleasure to be here. And yeah, I guess I am. I'm not famous, but uh, <laughs> maybe within this tiny niche Bitcoin space, people, some people do know who I am, but we're still very early on this Bitcoin thing. And if anyone is listening at home to, to, these, to us discuss right now, then they should also know that they are very early. And that, yeah, we are definitely still at the beginning of the, the Bitcoin evolution or revolution. I'm not sure what to, to call it anymore. But yeah, thanks for having me on. And yeah, tremendous intro. Well done. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about uh, your story. How did you discover Bitcoin? How did you become uh, a Bitcoin journalist, advocate? What's, uh, what's the story of uh, Joe Nakamoto? Cool. Okay, thanks. I mean, is Joe Nakamoto your real name? I suppose not. <laughs> yeah, I was just about to answer that one. Um, yeah. So Joe Nakamoto actually evolved from Crypto Joe as I got trolled online. I used to call it Crypto Joe because I thought it rhymed and it showed my interest in the cryptocurrency movement. And then a few maxi, like Bitcoin maximalists, you know, people that think that everything else in crypto is basically a scam and the Bitcoin is the one true sort of currency or the one true monetary asset that's going to, you know, revolutionize the world. They basically said, oh, well, you can't be writing about Bitcoin if you're called Crypto Joe. And I was like, oh, it rhymes and it's a Trojan horse because it gets people who are interested in crypto to look at Bitcoin stuff. And they said, well, if you want it to rhyme, then why don't you just call it Joe Nakamoto? You know, that rhymes and that clearly shows a preference for Satoshi Nakamoto, the pseudonymous creator of Bitcoin. So that's how the Joe Nakamoto brand uh, came about. And obviously, I've stuck with it because for three years now, I guess, my social media handles have been that Joe Nakamoto thing. And then how did I get into the Bitcoin space? In, in a serious way, it started in like 2021, but I've been following and writing and making content about Bitcoin since 2019. And then I'd actually used Bitcoin as money in 2011. So, you know, when I was a student at, at Edinburgh University, studying economics and languages, I used Bitcoin on the Silk Road, but didn't think anything of it. You know, that is nothing to do with equities, nothing to do with, you know, assets. That was simply a student doing what a student does best um, and, you know, discovering things online and discovering things about themselves. But I wrote off Bitcoin because it was slow, clunky, expensive, hard to find, hard to access, hard to use. And while, you know, that whole user experience of the Silk Road was fascinating because, you know, effectively it was a place to buy, you know, the like things like I was just buying weed online, right? Which is, you know, not a big deal in lots of places around the world, but it was still, of course, um, dodgy in the UK. There you had this tool, which was the Bitcoin thing that allowed you to access it. Um, but I don't have access to those wallets and Bitcoin back then was probably less than $10. Now, of course, Bitcoin's somewhere in the 60,000 range. You're going to oh, so, say something, sorry. Yeah. So basically, I didn't... I. Like Silk Road, for the people who um, don't know it, if there's still anyone that, that, that doesn't know it, it was a website where you could buy all kinds of drugs, but all the illegal stuff and uh, that, what that was brought down by uh, the feds, if I remember, and all their coins uh, seized and their... Uh, and the founder is uh, now in jail. Uh, but I didn't know that they were operating 
internationally, I thought it was only US-based and for US customers that had an international reach. Wow. Yeah, it, all the way to Scotland where I was studying. And I think in England as well, you know, someone who wasn't me, of course, used it there. But yeah, that was my, I guess, my first touch point. And then I had a few more touch points, as everyone does before they come around to Bitcoin. I don't know anyone that like reads the white paper and just goes, yes, I'm going all in on Bitcoin. It took me a long time to get there. Um, but yeah, the, you know, I, I met a guy in Portugal in 2017 who got very rich during that bull run. And then in 2019, I started studying it and taking it seriously. So I did these blockchain courses online. I did like a Coursera thing. I did an edX um, course as well, all about blockchain and its implications. And I couldn't understand why this blockchain thing was important. Um, but it's because it isn't important, basically, you know, long story short, um, the only real useful implicate use case for blockchain is Bitcoin in which it's a time chain anyway, uh, but I won't go too maxi right now. I'll just explain yeah. how I got into the Bitcoin thing. Basically while I was working at Oxford business group, which is a uh, UK media and journalism company that sells its research to Bloomberg professional services, Reuters, uh, Icon, a few others and investor terminals. I realized that remittances into the Ivory Coast were to some extent increasing thanks to Bitcoin. So I pitched these stories to my editors and they basically said, oh, it's a scam. Don't look at that. And I was like, but it's happening. You know, <laughs> People are using this as a tool. So we should be reporting on that because that's my job as a financial journalist at the time. And I was living in Abidjan and this is why I was speaking French as well. And my driver, actually, a guy called Guillaume showed me you know, how we received Bitcoin from his son who lived in Paris. And I was like, this is crazy. And I was also sort of trying to understand why on earth he wouldn't use Western Union or a banking service. And that's when he said, well, I can't really read and write. I don't have a proof of address or a proof. Well, he'd ha he had a proof of address, but he didn't have proof of uh, date of birth or a birth certificate. And of course, Bitcoin is a way to bank the unbanked. And so that was when the light bulb really went off because I was in Africa living in a very disadvantaged, disadvantaged country, but that was also like poised to have like amazing e economic growth. Like you're Lebanese French, right? Like there's a lot of right. Lebanese in West Africa who see that opportunity there. And so that's when I started to realize that, oh gosh, this Bitcoin thing isn't just for the rich and for the privileged few. It's also for those who don't have access to banking services and who are largely cut off because of KYC and AML requirements. Of course, KYC in the West is all about, you know, proving who you are. But in West Africa, a lot of people can't prove who they are. So it it handicaps them before they're even able to access you know, basic financial services. And so that's where I started to get more and more orange pilled, orange pilled being, you know, going down this Bitcoin rabbit hole and realizing that central banking and fiat currencies are not great for human development. And that's when I realized through my Oxford Business Group stuff that I would have to either work in the crypto space to continue being a journalist or to eventually go independent, which is what I am now. So just to really quickly squashed together that 2019 to 2024 period. I eventually got tired of the Oxford Business Group stuff. The pandemic happened. I did some remote consultancy work for them while still trying to push this Bitcoin stuff while getting more and more like orange pilled. Of course, the 2021 bull run comes around. I start working for Cointelegraph and I write almost exclusively about Bitcoin content. Then I started doing video stuff. Um, the first video I did was actually at the World Economic Forum in Davos in 2021, I believe. Um, where I tried to <laughs> approach random people on the streets of Davos and ask them about Bitcoin. That video is still on YouTube somewhere. And that's when I realized, okay, the video stuff is more impactful than writing and I need to put my face out there a bit more. And that sort of created this Joe Nakamoto brand. And then, yeah, eventually quit Cointelegraph in December of this year. And I've been in independent for the past couple of months where I'm trying to work out how to monetize this journalism and research content and also how to best spread this message that bitcoin is not a scam bitcoin is not for criminals and you know bitcoin is actually in use in places like ghana peru el salvador senegal cuba all of these places i've made documentaries about so i can <laughs> you can don't trust verify all this information that i'm saying and that's what i'm hoping to continue to do this year i mean you covered so many topics i don't know where to start i, I feel like your bitcoin journey is very close to uh, anyone's journey where you start with the uh, criminal legal stuff and this is where you're using it or you're hearing about it this is what comes out most mm. often on uh, anyone's radar all the criminal activities that are done 
but then and, and people tend to diss it out and then they hear about this person that made so much money and <laughs> on Bitcoin and then they go back interested and mm -hmm. they start studying it and then uh, they see how volatile it is and uh, you go through bull and bear markets so you, a lot of people burn their uh, wings uh, touching it so they stop and then mm. it needs like real to spend some time and education and understand that it's like the internet there's a lot of bad actors on the internet but the majority is uh, for good use and when you see the first immediate use cases like you were uh, saying uh, about uh, your experience in africa i mm -hmm. had the same experience in lebanon and uh, you start like seeing all the defaults of the uh, financial system in which uh, you've been operating all these years without questioning why uh, why is it like that and and why and, and it becomes dysfunctional actually once you see this alternative because before having seen it you don't see it as a dysfunctional system on the contrary you feel like it's in the hands of very serious people very well established doctrines and uh, monetary theories and uh, very like establishment uh, focused uh, groups that are catering for our needs but then mm -hmm. once you see like what's the alternative with bitcoin you go like uh, wow no this is something that is much greater technology how how, exactly. how how was the reaction of people at the davos summit when you were asking them about bitcoin it was funny and interesting of course some of these elites um, between, you know, quotation marks, they have Bitcoin and they've had Bitcoin for a long time. And lots of smart, influential, powerful people are working within a system, which, you know, the system you described, whilst also aware of this new system. And they want to keep one foot in both, you know, because that's, that's what smart people do. Um, they don't go full send and all in on Bitcoin the way that I have done, for example. Um, but other people had not heard of Bitcoin before, which is very common wherever I go around the world. Um, some, some of those people had never said the word Bitcoin. So I'd be like, oh, like, what's your opinion on Bitcoin? They'd be like, Bitcoin? Bitcoin? You know, and that's, I'm actually putting together right now a montage of people mispronouncing the word Bitcoin just to prove to the world that while us in our bubble, we think that we're close to some sort of greater or more meaningful level of adoption, we're really not like there, there are billions of people that do not know what Bitcoin is, have never used it and are never going to use it in the next six months. Um, while there's, you know, this hard sort of intransigent minority of people who are really trying to evangelize and spread this Bitcoin message as best as possible. And then finally, there was the last part of these people in Davos who wanted to take the mick of me and wanted to troll me. Um, one guy like kept being like, oh, it's because I was wearing the Bitcoin B as a giant symbol on my chest. And I was like pointing at saying, do you know what this is? And if they knew what it is, we'd have an interview. And one guy walked past and said, oh, it's Bugatti. And then he came back and was like, oh, it must be Bentley. Um, so you know you're in Davos when someone confuses just a, ran a random B for some of the most luxury brands in the world. Um, and eventually, yeah, he trolled a bit more. Um, but it was, it was eye-opening. And I find that this man in the street interview, um, it's like one of the tools that I use to evaluate Bitcoin adoption around the world. I, I did it in El Salvador. I've done it in um, Bedford, where Peter McCormack has this uh, Bitcoin football team. I've done it in Peru, and recently I did it in Madeira, in, in Funchal. I mean, it's it's the oldest form of journalism. It's like citizen or, um, what do you call it? Street journalism, I guess you call it. Advocacy journalism? I forget the name of the name, but yeah, guerrilla journalism. You're just you know, asking people for vox pops in the streets to get a sense of, okay, do people in this small place where apparently there's high levels of Bitcoin adoption, do they actually know what's going on here? Do they care? Are they, you know, saving in Bitcoin, for example? Um, and yeah, it's just I, one I, way I of used, doing it. I, I used to um, believe uh, that um, spreading the word uh, is uh, an important aspect. Mm -hmm. But um, I think the media coverage today of Bitcoin is massive. It's not anymore mm -hmm. like a niche product in terms of media coverage or if, in terms of knowledge. Of course, if you walk down the street, you're going to see some people who, depending on where you are, that never heard about Bitcoin, but it's less and less the case. However, that being said, what the metrics that I like to focus on, and this is more like from an investor's perspective, 
is how much uh, the asset is known compared to how much the allocation to the asset is small. Like NVIDIA, everybody heard about it. And, and most of the people that heard about it are have put a punt on it or uh, are considering it or um, are reflecting about it. In Bitcoin, like 99% of the people who heard about it haven't allocated anything on it because, and even if they allo- if they have allocated, it's like 0.001% of their uh, wealth and not considering mm-hmm. it as a real financial allocation. Mm-hmm. Um, and hopefully with the, I mean, with the issuance of the ETF in the U.S., we're going to have like, uh, we, we are having like 11 of the top investment advisors going in and uh, advising their clients, educating them and advising them to allocate to, uh, to the asset class. And I, I feel like from journalism to allocation, there is a gap and these mm. ETFs are, are, are closing this gap. Do you agree on that? To an extent, yes, but I think it also depends where you are in the world. Like we are to some extent skewed by what goes on in the US. And given that, you know, the US has these incredibly successful, like record breaking ETFs, then we think that we're in a certain place. But if you look at the UK, for example, up until yesterday, it was really, really difficult to get exposure to Bitcoin in a meaningful way. So I mean, and if you look at, say, Algeria or Tunisia or Morocco, Bitcoin is illegal. The same applies in Bolivia. Um, So while we consider this to be a borderless, decentralized internet currency that anyone can access, um, it really does depend on what the regulators uh, think about it and how the regulators punish it to an extent. Um, I think that, yeah, the media coverage has been very positive lately, given that the price has been going up. But that is where it stops. They don't tend to focus on or the implications of the price going up, or the fact that places that have adopted Bitcoin earlier than others, whether it's El Salvador or places in Costa Rica or these communities in Peru, um, they are starting to get some added benefits um, from their sort of Bitcoin adoption story. Uh, And on top of that, it's all price focused. It's never focused on the fact that we can just transact with each other peer to peer without a middleman, which is the whole point of Bitcoin, right? I know that obviously the price going up is one of the biggest drivers, like 90% of the reason why people get interested in Bitcoin is because the price go up. But there's this extra 10%, which the media just always disregards. And then that's also forgetting Bitcoin mining, which again is a huge lever for economic progress and one of the perhaps most effective ways of addressing some of the biggest problems that our generation faces, which is you know climate change, um, energy security, and of course, you know, wealth, the wealth gap widening um, even further. So yeah, it's um, I, I'm, I've been largely disappointed with the media and that's why I wanted to do my own thing. Um, there was a nice report by the BBC yesterday about some guy buying a, a burger with Bitcoin in a, in, a, in a shop in London. But in the same video analysis, they brought on one of the biggest like idiotic Bitcoin analysts. Um, on Radio 4 yesterday, there was a report by one of the lead sort of the hosts of that show and she was saying that Bitcoin remains this niche currency. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but this niche currency is bigger than silver. <laughs> it's bigger than um, most of the biggest companies in the world. At what point do you stop your framing of this as being like some weird ner- nerdy thing and realize that it's being mainstreamified, if I can use that as a word, oh. um, right before our eyes, while all these journalists are, are still trying to be like, oh, but what is Bitcoin? And who is Satoshi Nakamoto? And what if he comes back? It's like, <laughs> guys, this was maybe a valid... Uh, 21 uh, new million uh, tokens. I, yeah. I, like, I, I share with so, you so the, 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 the disappointment about the price that is in um, reasons to uh, the adoption. But mm. I mean, I'm sure like if Bitcoin was a stable coin, with the same decentralized uh, setup, it would have been adopted much, much, much more because at the end, um, making money from Bitcoin is so compelling compared to just buying your coffee in Bitcoin versus your local currency or sending remittances, etc. So um, I do agree with you that it brings a reason to the adoption. So people are not mm. concentrated on adoption. Actually, our ETF, which is an, a Bitcoin equities ETF. So we mm. invest in companies, in listed companies around the Bitcoin space. 
and we struggle to find a universe big enough to mm-hmm. invest in. Our, our investment universe is around 100 companies, but it should be like much, much more compared to equivalent in terms of side of, of other asset classes. So, okay. um, and there hasn't been any concentration. So if there is a concentration tomorrow, it will be like even shorter. Mm-hmm. And also when you look at the funds that have, uh, even the private equity s- space, when you look at how much money was raised for Bitcoin private equity funds compared to a Web3 or, or other type of VC funds, it's still too little because people prefer to just buy Bitcoin instead of financing projects that bring adoption, etc. Which brings us to, to your business model too. So how, how are you planning on monetizing your independent journalism? Since most people that will look at, that will listen to you will go and just buy Bitcoin and will not necessarily reward you. <laughs> I know, right? And shame on them. They should be sending me, sending me all their Bitcoin. I'm joking, of course. It's it's this tricky. Could be right? like because... a royalty, you know, like uh, <laughs> when you make there are... somebody discover something out of the blue and it makes his life so much better. Yeah, <laughs> that would be nice. But I mean, on top of that, I tend to focus. I don't ever really talk about the price, and I don't want to ever be one of those YouTube analysts or journalists that just talks about the price because. The whole my whole shtick is there's so much more to this than the price. Um, I do always put up a QR code at the end of every video that I publish. I haven't yet received a fiat money donation, you know, whether it's you know pounds or euros or dollars or whatever. So of course, to a large extent, my content is tailored to a Bitcoin audience, but I want it to be very mainstream friendly. So when I bring up or when someone I interview brings up a term like the halving or Um, I don't know, lightning, I always try to do a little explainer of what this is so that my mum, for example, can watch my content and find it entertaining, informative, hopefully a bit educational, but also just like, you know, easy, easy watching. A lot of my content is based around travel stuff. But um, the monetization aspect, there are certain ways you can approach this as a creator. You can go down the value value for value route. You can go down the direct sponsorship route. And then you can go down the sort of, it's not quite begging, but, you know, crowdfunding begging route. Um, so for value for value, you've got Nostra, which is this decentralized protocol that a lot of big name entrepreneurs quite like, like Jack Dorsey. He supports it. Um, he's the founder of uh, Twitter, of course. Um, I found that to be very unsuccessful and still we're still too early for that. Like every time you do a post, which basically looks like a tweet or an Instagram post, people can zap that, which means they send sats to it over the Lightning Network. The Lightning Network is the Layer 2 network built on Bitcoin, which is basically like open up, opening up a bar tab with people all around the world that you can then close, if you so wish, onto the Bitcoin blockchain layer one. But it just allows you to make really that's, fast, that's, really uh, cheap transactions. That's the best explanation I've heard so far about the Lightning Network. I've never thought about it as a bar tab. It's a, it's a great uh, example. Speaking oh, of the Lightning say. Network, I wanted to get your opinion because I've been advocating for Bitcoin myself and trying to mm-hmm. orange pill uh, people. And uh, when I started like just sending Bitcoin to mm. people instead of like going through monetary theory and technology and the blockchain, etc., just like I'm going to send you $10 now yeah, and, and look how fast it is. Now mm. send it back to me in fiat and, and see how complicated <laughs> it is. I find it like a very orange pilling moment. Do, do, mm. did, did you share like this kind of uh, experience? What's, What's your feedback in general to best orange pill someone? Oof. I mean, there is no best way to orange pill someone because everyone eventually orange pills themselves, right? Like we, you can introduce people to Bitcoin very easily, but to get like orange pill is kind of to challenge your preconceived ideas and notions and to, you know, to, to reflect what you were saying earlier, to realize that the system we're in, we've never really questioned why we're in it and if there's a different path and Bitcoin does repre- represent that different way of approaching your finances, your future, like money as a whole. Um, I do have that sort of light bulb moment sometimes when I send Bitcoin to people. Usually I just ask them to download a Lightning wallet. More recently, I've asked them to download uh, the Bitcoin Beach wallet because in that app, there are lessons that people can do. And every time they do a lesson, they get a few sats. And sats are just pence to pounds or cents to dollars or cents to euros. It's the smallest amount of a Bitcoin. And so that's like, you, you send them a bit of Bitcoin, then sometimes I'll tweet their QR code to like my followers on Twitter 
And so they will suddenly see sats flying into their wallet from all around the world, which is kind of cool because it's like, it proves to them that I'm not scamming them, that in fact, that there's a community of crazy hardcore evangelists all around the world who are happy to send them 69 sats or 2000 sats, which is, you know, maybe a dollar or two. Um, and sometimes they leave a message, which is kind of cool because it'll be like, you know, hola from Peru or something, or, you know, hi from New York. And when people start to see that, they're like, oh my God, it's not just you random British dude who's quite keen on this Bitcoin thing. It's also this giant community of Bitcoin believers and evangelists out there who are actually really passionate about seeing this thing succeed because they're confident that if we do adopt a Bitcoin standard, we will have a more peaceful world, you know, a fairer world and a, a world in which your money isn't eroded over time by central banking and governments. I love it. I really love it because uh, I've went through the experience of like uh, sending, asking someone to download a Lightning wallet, sending mm. him sats. Mm. But uh, you add on top on top of it another layer, which like you tweet his the, Q, the QR code and he starts receiving sats for all the from all the community, so he can see like mm. there are real a lot of people talking and and sharing his view and. And, and and interested in making it successful. In our case, what we did is we developed a Bitcoin Academy app. And okay. when you take lessons, you earn sats. So you can yeah. so it's similar, but 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 we start with the education while you start mm -hmm. with the wallet. I, I'm gonna think about it. This one uh, is really interesting. Well, because Usually it'll be off the back of an interview. So I'll say like, thank you for the interview. You know, can yeah. I send you some money? And they'll be like, how? And I'll be like, well, all you do is download an app and away you go. And like I did a talk in Istanbul two weeks ago and I wanted to make the demonstration visual. Like when I do lectures or talks, like it's, it's nice to stand up on the stage with a nice slideshow or presentation and talk through, you know, monetary theory and all that stuff. But I'm like, sod that. Let's get a volunteer on stage. Um, let's get them to hold their phone up. I'll tweet it out and then I'll tweet out the QR code and you'll yeah. see the phone just like pinging with sats constantly. <laughs> and I, you know, I did this on stage in Istanbul and I, I said like every time the phone like zaps with money, can you shout the word Bitcoin while I give the talk? So he stood there shouting Bitcoin every <laughs> like 10 seconds while I was trying to explain how the Lightning Network works and how people can use it as a merchant um, at their shops or uh, as part of their business ideas. Um, I did a second demonstration, which was, I put a invoice on someone else's phone for like $5 and I tweeted a picture of that um, and said, you know, can you pay this? And we did a countdown of how long it'll take before someone pays it. And it was like less than 20 seconds. Um, like I do have some, like a, uh, like a few thousand followers, of course, like it is more likely to be seen by people, but I've also seen people replicate this demonstration with, you know, fewer followers and still with like successful results. So it does happen. Results. Okay. But the, the implications of that are really interesting, right? Like imagine you're 13 years old and you have a lightning wallet and you've run out of money or whatever. You, you go to your McDonald's in El Salvador, which accepts Bitcoin lightning, and you just take a picture of that QR code, send it to your dad and say, dad, can you pay this? Like it, it, it's, it's, I mean, you can do this with some banking apps. I know you can do that in, um, with MBWay in Portugal, for example. Um, but this is lightning, so it's, Anywhere in the world, you can do this that accepts Bitcoin. Yeah. yeah. And it, there are just lots of parts of the Bitcoin space that we haven't quite discovered or investigated thoroughly yet. And that could have second and third order consequences that we just were not even aware of. Like you, we could have a QR code in the corner of this uh, screen right now and people could stream. They could either zappers or they could stream sats. That's another one. Like, do you know the podcasting app Fountain? No. How, how does it work? So it's like Spotify or any other RSS feed, but you can basically pay one sat per minute to the creator that you're listening to to say thank you. Oh, okay. And, be yeah. and because those Lightning Network bar tabs are friction, well, they're basically fr frictionless and don't cost a lot of money. It's an easy way to you know, monetize between the creator and the person consuming the content. And if you're you know, sending one sat a minute, you don't really care, but it's a nice way of creating that um, connection between the audience and you know, the person putting the content out there in the first place. I think just, there's a lot of more of these ideas that we're only just seeing the we're just seeing the, the surface level right now. Yeah, yeah. And um, I want to take you a little bit to the limit of uh, your Bitcoin advocacy. So, okay. your Bitcoin only, I would say. What mm -hmm. 
why only Bitcoin? Why not? Uh, I mean, I'm playing the devil's advocate here because I share your conviction, but just for the sake of uh, this conversation, why not uh, other cryptos like uh, Ethereum, which has an amazing track record, has a great price performance, has um, much more utility than Bitcoin because you can put smart contracts on top of it. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of uh, blockchain projects uh, coming on, uh, competing and uh, improving the ecosystem. What's your opinion mm -hmm. on all this? Yeah, I mean, I, when you're looking at Ethereum, you should probably look at BNB and Solana and Cardano and Shiba and Avalanche yeah. and Polkadot and Ton and all exactly. the other. Is it 20, 25,000 cryptos? Like, if you've got the time and the inclination to look at those 25,000 cryptos, you go. Um, best of luck to you. I, I support you on that mission, me personally, and I'm not going to tell people off or attack people or dunk on people for their advocacy for these, um, you know, projects and tokens. People love to gamble and it's human nature to, to gamble. Like casinos are one of the most effective business models in the world. And they're effective for a reason, because as humans, we love that adrenaline rush that you get when you, you know, get close to losing then win. Um, yeah, but know, it's not about picking a casino, like most people buying all these cryptos are not uh, buying it as a casino player, but they're buying it as a um, stock pickers, I would say. True. And, you know, that that's uh, a great argument to be made. Uh, let's just address the points you made there at the start. So the price performance has, has been excellent. It's been excellent in dollar terms, but relative to Bitcoin, it's just making lower and lower highs. So you're better off just buying Bitcoin and sticking to that if your play is just money, you know, which is a lot of a lot of Bitcoiners are just caring about the speculative nature of it all. You know, that's why the ETF is so successful. Um, so, yeah, if you're look, just looking to make money, then maybe you are better off gambling on Dog with Hat or Pepe or any of these meme tokens um, because they are fundamentally just speculative plays. Um, if you're really interested in the crypto side of things, there's no reason why you can't study these blockchains and think, you know, and use them as a learning tool. But if you're going to put your money in them, then isn't it better to put your, your money in something which is genuinely decentralized and secure as opposed to something which is centralized and potentially insecure? You know, they, Bitcoin had a, it wasn't a hard fork, but it was like a quite a aggressive soft fork in 2010 but it's never ever been hacked and it's one of the most secure computer networks in the world. You know, it's more secure than any government agency network or any, uh, or a Google or a Microsoft or whatever. Um, Ethereum had a hard fork within a few months of its creation and continues to hard fork. Tomorrow, it's having another hard fork. Um, I'm a believer in the fact that once we have secure and decentralized money um, with our hard cut, then we should stick to that at all costs. And if you're interested in what these words soft fork and hard fork mean, and what they could mean for the future of the industry, then I really recommend you read the book called The Block Size War by Jonathan Beer. It's a really, really good explainer of why. I mean, that was one of the books that for me helped me get conviction about this Bitcoin thing. Um, another point you brought up was... So what you're saying is that in, the, um, <laughs> in this book, basically he explains the history of the hard folks and how none of them succeeded. And therefore, we should stick with the original and it applies mm. not only for uh, Bitcoin forks, but for all other cryptocurrencies, because the original one is a truly decentralized one without any uh, influential uh, parties uh, trying to change it or to, uh, to, uh, to gain benefit out of it, right? Mm. Yeah, I mean, you could hold a gun up to Vitalik Buterin or Joe Lubin's head, and you could probably instigate some sort of change within Ethereum to your benefit. Um, on top of that, like this is, it's not really, this is a question of taste or ethics, but I don't like that Ethereum and every other cryptocurrency ever, apart from I think maybe Nano, had a pre-mine. Um, a pre-mine being there was an allocation to the founders, to the VCs, etc., because they knew that this token would be worthwhile when the rest of retail and you know other companies started to buy in on this token. Like a lot of people hate on this kind of thing. I think that's just the way the world works, but I don't like it. So I don't want to put my money in that either. I think it's just a bit unethical and a bit, um, it's just a bit arrogant. I don't know. I, I, I'm not a big fan of um, the, the pre-mine nature of all these okay, um, but, cryptocurrencies. But let's assume tokens. there is one that is uh, a new cryptocurrency that is fairly launched and uh, that have um, 
uh, functionalities that are way beyond Bitcoin. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking about tokenized assets, DeFi, um, all types of uh, Web3 projects where uh, they're using the blockchain to mm -hmm. tokenize the world and uh, to have all kind of value, not only money, exchangeable in a decentralized manner. Mm -hmm. Why? Why wouldn't you adopt this one? <laughs> I mean, yeah, you go. You enjoy that. Um, I will stick to Bitcoin, if that's okay. Um, does the world really need more DeFi, more decent, more tokens on blockchain, all this sort of stuff? Um, this, is, this is when I come back to the fact that with Bitcoin, you can save your money and therefore your time into this asset, knowing that it will slowly appreciate over time, sometimes faster than, you know, sometimes it's a lot faster than it's slow. Um, and you can focus on your passions and go out there and live your life more intentionally. With a lot of these DeFi protocols and things, they are basically encouraging you to spend more time looking at computers, trying to financialize your life, trying to put all the assets you own onto a blockchain so you can make more money to do what? To, to do more of that? Um, so again, it comes down to me, a, a question of, of taste. And then we use these words like they are, you know, throwaway piece of paper, like de decentralized. They are not decentralized. Like even the the exchange side shift that was um I forget the name of the big he's a big sort of Bitcoin and Ethereum advocate. I forget his name. Uh, you know, they've been recently fined by the SEC and yet they're a decentralized exchange. Like I, I'm I'm a firm believer in the fact that decentralization or centralization is not a spectrum. Either I, either it is decentralized or it is not. If you can instigate a change by fining someone, holding a gun up to someone's head or generally disrupting the service through one attack vector, then it's probably centralized, no? Whereas no. if you can't, then it's probably decentralized. And Bitcoin is the only coin, in my opinion, that has is sufficiently decentralized. And another point that I haven't really dis discussed yet, is the one that's actually, it does have proper or absolute digital scarcity, right? Um, when I tell you or sell you my NFT, I'm basically telling you that it has uh, digital scarcity because there's a line of code on the tron blockchain or on the ethereum blockchain which says it is but we're just both buying into this belief cycle that ethereum is sufficiently decentralized so it won't change and this line of code is unique because we both put a big price tag on it um but when it comes down to it you could fork that ethereum blockchain as it has done several times and you could create a competitive blockchain on which that line of code could exist so you're <laughs> You're both playing this weird imaginary game, which is fine because that's what a lot of life is. But just know that underpinning all of this, it's a big web of sort of like wishy-washy terminology, which isn't that far from just outright lies and outright scams. Um, so uh, again, I, I, if, if people are listening to this and they're holding a big bag of Web3 tokens and crypto stuff and whatever, like go for it by all means, but just know that you're on very shaky foundations and it might be worth looking at what is money, what's the history of money, and that's when you really, you know, talk about the things you discussed earlier. Look at monetary theory, and it might give you more resolution to more resolve rather to look at ten years into the future, twenty years into the future, maybe a hundred years into the future, knowing that this Bitcoin thing will outlive us all. Whereas Ethereum, Solana, Tron, all this stuff, yeah, it could be useful right now for certain things, but it's not a you're not betting on a better future. You're just betting on the next sort of six months and making a bit of money, which is fine. But, you know, I, I, would, I would want my life and people around me, their lives to be a bit different, you know, to, to think a bit more like, okay, what am I going to be doing when I'm 40? What am I doing when I'm, you know, 70? How do I want that life to look? And is Bitcoin the tool that's going to get me there? Well, yes, it is. Is Doge? No, it absolutely isn't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I totally hear you. And kind, I mean, this is this is the conviction we had at Melanian. And that's why we launched a Bitcoin equities ETF. And mm -hmm. uh, all the other competitors try to launch blockchain ETFs or digital assets ETF and stuff like mm -hmm. around cryptos and blockchain in general. Because our conviction was about Bitcoin. However... It mm. pains me to see that um, now that we're going through another bull run, we're going to see the same mistakes because I have seen it with the ICO craze and then with the SBF, DeFi, etc. craze. And mm. now I'm like, I'm wondering what's going to be the new hype, thematic, 
that people will pick up. Like I saw some AI tokens now, they're getting some appetite and like, there's always like something that's going to cancel the important message, which is like Bitcoin is here to stay. And this is where you should focus on. And you're much like, like I would say for my friends to go and invest more on Bitcoin instead of investing a little bit on some unknown tokens, basically, because you have a much uh, secure and uh, sure asset with a track record that is uh, amazing. Going back to you your- You can run a node. Like yeah. just one last thing on that is that you can run a node easily. I tried to run an Ethereum node in 2021. I gave up because it's basically impossible. But for a Bitcoin no node, all you do is go to bitcoincore.org, download, and that's it. You're now verifying every transaction that was ever made on the Bitcoin blockchain. And it's still, not, uh, the, affordable is not the right word, but it's still attainable for most people because you can just save it onto your, lap like I have an old Bloomberg laptop running my Bitcoin node. And it, you know, yeah, that's why it's it decentralized and secure. How, how simple it is to, to run it. Mm. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's weirdly and elegant. And, and as a uh, journalist and uh, media professional, I would say, how do you, what do you think is missing out there to shift mm -hmm. this narrative in the mainstream? I mean, the ETF are helping a lot, but uh, we're still struggling on Bitcoin mining. People believe mm -hmm. there's a lot of energy wasted uh, on, on all these computers doing stupid calculations. Let's centralize it and uh, move to proof of stake or other stuff like that. Um, wh what, what do you think is missing from to switch the media coverage from Bitcoin is bad to Bitcoin is great? Knowing mm -hmm. that... Um, they would they would uh, be always more rewarded and have more clicks mm. when they write articles bitcoin in ba is bad versus articles uh, bitcoin is good so um, if tomorrow they run an article uh, bitcoin was used uh, in uh, for kidnapping someone mm. it will uh, sell much more than uh, bitcoin was used to uh, send uh, a remittance uh, to Africa, you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's just the nature of what we're interested in as well, right? We like salacious, gossipy stories. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, while there is lots of things missing, I think it would be short-sighted of me to not comment that it has changed a lot in the past, like three to four years. I mean, that you, you've been in the Bitcoin space for 10, 11 years now. So you've seen some of those horrific uh, commentaries, like the Newsweek article that said that Bitcoin would consume all of the world's electricity by 2020. Yeah. And it was published in 2017. Actually, actually when I read it, I started uh, shitcoining. <laughs> I said, no, <laughs> man, hold on. There's a problem in Bitcoin and scalability. Let's go and look at Ethereum. And this is go. where I bought some, actually. But then um, I uh, found a French guy, uh, Sebastien Gouspillou. I don't know if you know him. Of course, He's, yeah, I know him. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, Good guy. He's using Bitcoin uh, mining to finance uh, a, a part the Virunga Park uh, yeah. protection in Africa. So uh, yeah. with the mining proceeds, uh, he's able to pay, to allow the, the park to pay uh, for all the people that work on protecting the silver-backed uh, gorillas. And I was like, wow, no, yeah. electricity consumption can be directed to a good use. And then I went back 100% Bitcoin. <laughs> wow. Well, félicitations, Seb, if he's listening. Um, bien joué. The, yeah, that, that story is amazing. And what's slightly, well, even more amazing about that story is that it was picked up by the MIT Review. So a very mainstream tech-focused magazine wrote this amazing essay about that story. And then just one month ago, the World Economic Forum published a short video explaining what Seb did with, I think it's big, big green data mining in the Virunga National Park. And it literally said, Bitcoin mining saved this park. So th there are definitely signs that some journalists and some editors are okay with publishing pro-Bitcoin stuff, um, but we, we still need to do a lot better. Um, I think the price is a huge factor still, unfortunately. You know, when, when Bitcoin hits 100K or 200K, there will be more and more articles coming out. There was one from The Economist on Sunday of this week where one of the commentators or analysts there said that this Bitcoin thing is 
definitely not a passing fad given that it has shown resilience and that it's, you know, again, rebounded to all-time highs, despite the fact that in 2021 and 2022, there were the biggest scandals the crypto industry as a whole had ever seen. Um, so it's not like some of the commentators are still stuck in 2012, 2013, Bitcoin is used for criminals, Bitcoin is used to money launder or whatever. And you've still got people like Jamie Dimon at, at you know, Morgan, JP Morgan Chase Bank D- saying, D- yeah, saying all these idiotic things. But there's also a BlackRock ETF and BlackRock is hoovering up. I don't know how many thousands of coins every day. Um, you've got stories like the gridless one in Kenya where Bitcoin mining is helping to electrify villages that literally were in the dark until Bitcoin mining was introduced to the region. And, you know, you've got people like, I made a documentary about a farmer in Northern Ireland who managed to effectively save his farm financially thanks to an investment into Bitcoin mining and setting up a Bitcoin, a small but still significant Bitcoin mine on top of his anaerobic digester. Um, So he's mining Bitcoin with gases released by farming cattle, sheep, and he also grows like animal feed, puts that in an anaerobic digester, that gives off methane, he captures the methane, which he then, it's biomethane or whatever, Mm. and then he burns that to um, generate electricity. And with the surplus electricity, he mines Bitcoin with it. Um, So anyone that has a surplus of electricity should seriously take a look at Bitcoin mining, not batteries, not, you know, some other renewable um, idea. Look at Bitcoin mining, because with that money, you can then look at making your existing operation even better. And and that's this, you know, whole wonderful world of um, the Bitcoin mining space that, again, the mainstream media just isn't very awake to. Yeah. And have you thought as a journalist, now independent journalist, of and since you're like doing uh, videos and live interventions i would say of doing like interventions on command on on who on on command like on order like being um, how do you say it in english like being asked to do a specific task and getting uh, paid for it I still don't know if I quite follow. What, what do you mean by a specific like, task? Like, like, like if I would ask you to go and do the same that you did at uh, the uh, World Economic Forum, to do it mm-hmm. uh, at the ECB, for example, would you do it? Happily. I would love to do that. Like commission. That that's, be... that's the word. Commission. Yeah, work. yeah, of course. Yeah, I am. Um... So I've not actually done any commissioned work, but I, oh, no, but I, I've not done any like paid work like that, but I've been invited to places to tell stories, which I really like. So there's this Bulgarian football team in Plovdiv, which is Bulgaria's second city. Have, have you seen this one, Jad? It's oh. a video. Okay. So it's a, basically this football team has adopted Bitcoin. That makes no sense. Like what on earth does a football team adopting Bitcoin mean? What does it look like? What do the fans think? Um, are they just in it for the money? Like what's going on here? So I flew out there um, because I'd heard about the story whilst working at Cointelegraph, but was quitting Cointelegraph at the time. And so I, yeah, I said to George, the head of Bitcoin there, that uh, his job is literally Bitcoin director of Plovdiv Football Club. Again, what on earth does that mean? So I wanted to go there with all these questions in mind and make a, a documentary about it. And then the other thing I, was, I did recently, which was this one wasn't on commission, but they paid for my flights and accommodation. I went to Turkey. Um, with Bitfinex, which is a big exchange, but they invited me there as a Bitcoin content creator. So basically, I was just there giving Bitcoin education, giving out free Bitcoin to people and trying to make content about this story. Um, but it's not quite commissioned yet. Hopefully, you know, <laughs> someone's going to turn around to me and say, hey, Joe, here's yeah, 10K. Let's, let's have this discussion out- uh, offline. I, I, have, I have a couple of ideas okay. that were done uh, by you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Happy to uh, I'm afraid we have to wrap it up. Thanks a lot for uh, sharing all these stories, Joe. And I look forward to having you again on the show. And we'll definitely share your QR code uh, when we launch the episode (laughs) so people that uh, are listening to us can uh, help you in your mission into spreading uh, Bitcoin uh, all over the world. (laughs) Love to hear it. Merci beaucoup, Jad. Merci beaucoup, uh your listeners um <laughs> thank you so much um hope to see you again soon and maybe maybe in paris one time we'll have that conversation online offline as well sure take care thank you very much yes